Dr. Uh, John H. Curry is an Associate Pro Professor of Education at Idaho State University and Chair of the Organizational Learning and Performance Department. He teaches courses in the Instructional Design and Technology Master's Program and in the EDD in Educational Leadership Program. His research interests include the design, development, and implementation of online learning and instruction, emerging learning technologies, and the mentoring of graduate students. He has published nine journal articles, six book chapters, in five conference proceedings, and three book reviews. Last year, his first book, The Greatest Lecture I Was Never Taught, was published. He has also given over 70 peer-reviewed conference presentations, as well as over 35 invited present presentations and workshops. Dr. Curry is active in his field. He was elected to the AECT, or Association for Educational Communications and Technology, Board of Directors, multiple terms. He also served on the executive committee the division leadership for both the Emerging Learning Technologies and the Technology Integrated Learning Divisions. He fulfilled numerous committee assignments and was a member of the Leadership Development Committee for a decade. He is currently the conference planner for the 2022 AECT International Convention, and he also planned the 2019 AECT International Convention. The AECT Division of Emerging Learning Technologies gives an annual, annual award, the John Curry Distin Distinguished Service Award, named for him in honor for his service to the division and the organization. He holds a PhD in Instructional Technology and an MA in the Theory and Practice of Writing, both from Utah State University. He also earned a BA in English from Brigham Young University. With that introduction, we'll turn the time over to Dr. Curry. <laughs> that's hilarious to hear that read out loud. Oh my gosh, that sounds incredibly pretentious, but I appreciate the, the opportunity to be here. Um, you know, uh, I thought a lot about what I wanted to say today, and I've talked with a lot of people before about OER. Um, and I sit on the university's OER committee as well. Um, I thought what I would do is talk a little bit about how I got here um, to, to my own usage and then talk about what I do. And I like to keep it super informal. And so that's what I plan on doing. Um, my first recollection of a textbook like is probably middle school. I'm sure there were in elementary school too, but I remember in middle school, you know, the teacher passing out the textbooks and we had to cover them to keep them nice. And, you know, I grew up in rural Oklahoma and, you know, some of the kids were rich enough that they had fancy textbook covers. And me, I was over there with brown paper bags, cutting them and trying to make them fit and taping them all on and I, that's my first thought of textbooks when I think of textbooks. Then I think about when I was a freshman in college and I went to, uh, I showed up again from rural Oklahoma, uh, 12 square miles is the town that I grew up in, Mustang. And I showed up on the BYU campus to go to school and, um, you know, some, you got to go get your textbooks now. And I didn't know what that meant, you know? Uh, and so I went to the BYU bookstore and walked onto this entire floor of just books everywhere in stacks. And, you know, I had to wander around and find my books and it was bananas. I mean, I was just like, this is insanity. How in the world does anybody supposed to navigate this mess? And from there, you know, then of course I saw the cost of books. And that was even worse. Well, I was an English major. And that was terrible, having textbook costs as an English major. Because we didn't get one book. You know, we would read nine novels over the course of a semester. 
And so my textbook costs as a student were insane. And then when you go to graduate school, of course, as we know, the books are big and thick and they cost an arm and a leg. And then generally you read like three chapters of them. And so that when I think of textbook, my own experience as a student, that's what I think of. So then I became a faculty member and I just did what I thought faculty members do. You know, I've got to teach this class. So, so I'm teaching intro to instructional design, say, well, I got to find an instructional design book. So I go ask others what they're doing. Of course, this is all pre-social media because I'm an old guy. So you ask other folks what they're doing and then you're just asking for desk copies and you're looking at them and going, I guess this book's okay. I had no earthly idea what I was doing. Um, in the meantime, uh, as Spencer said, my, my degree is in the field of instructional technology, which is the field of study where OER actually comes out of. And um, the kind of OER guy, the guy who is Mr. OER is a fellow by the name of David Wiley. And David and I have known each other since we were graduate students. I was at Utah State, he was at BYU. So David and I have been good friends for about oh, coming up on 25 years. And uh, as a matter of fact, he's the one that I'm planning this year's conference with. Um, but I, I talked to David o on and off over the years about OER because he was just preaching the gospel of OER. And I would listen to him and I'd tune him out because he'd go, oh, you got to tune him out because that's all I ever heard from him. And I'll, we'd go to conferences and that's what he wanted to talk about. So um, about 15 years ago, he and I were at an AECT summer research symposium and we presented back to back from each other. And uh, we had some time after his presentation. And of course he talked on OER. And um, I just looked at him and I said, David, convince me. Right now's your chance. Convince me why I should do this. And I don't remember everything that he said. I don't, but I remember two things that he said. One was, why should knowledge cost money? And two was, you just have to make the commitment and don't look back. And I thought about those as I drove from, we were in Bloomington, Indiana, as I drove from Bloomington, Indiana, back to, to Moorhead, Kentucky, where I was at the time. And I really pondered on that. So for me, it was... Am I willing, the, the deciding factor was, am I willing to make this plunge for my students? And, you know, um, I liked getting free books as a professor. You know, it was awesome, but most of them sit and I don't use them at all. But for me, it really came down to, was I willing to make the plunge? So I decided then and there, that I was, that I was willing to do it. So what I did is I, I decided for me um, and the way that things worked at my last university that what I could, uh, um, that I was going to write my own content and use as many open education resources that I could. And it took me to get through, because we all teach in the kind of, normal rotation of courses right you know we teach the same things in the fall and then the spring um and so for me it took me about two years to get my first draft I mean I, I was taught the courses as best I could but to get the content where I really felt comfortable with it it took me about two years to get all of my courses written and it was hard and it was and it, and it took a lot of time. And then on top of that, to go try to find the open education resources that go with it was even a bigger nightmare. Um, but slowly but surely, that happened. Now, one of the things that's very fortunate, again, because it's the field that I'm in, is there are a lot, probably, there are probably more open education resources in my field than almost any other. And 
like I said, that this we're the field of study where this comes out of. But there's actually, and especially for graduate level study of of our field, there's a a website called edtechbooks.org. And uh, it's curated by a guy named Royce Kimmons out of BYU. But most of the textbooks written in my field now are written OER, and which is a great blessing to us to be able to, to use them um, in our field. Um, publishing in an OER book is uh, sometimes um, in some fields, they don't look at it the same way. They think, well, you just it's on some website. How can it really be peer reviewed or something like that? In my field, if uh, if you've got something that's in one of the books on OER, or excuse me, on edtechbooks.org or in an, any OER journal, that's that's counted as as highly desirable. And so, um, I have a history with the OER research because of my field, and I have a history with the implementation because of my field. Um, but for me personally, the decision to implement it all came down to that question was whether or not I was willing to put in the time. I don't think I do anything special. I really don't. I think my students appreciate not having to write, not having to buy books. I think that's accurate. But I think it's beyond not having to buy a book because the content still has to be there. The content's got to be there for them to get what they need out of the class. So what I have in my classes, if you were, if you were to go look at one of my courses, now my program is all completely online. I've taught almost exclusively completely online for about 25 years now. That's just, again, the nature of my field. So everything's got to be set up in Moodle or it was Blackboard at my last school. It was Desire to Learn at the previous school. So everything has to be set up for online learning. So I do, um, uh, I have my content set up that I've written about the topic, but then I also shoot video. And uh, with, the, with the advent of Zoom and just being able to sit in front of my computer, I now reshoot those videos every semester because it's just easy to sit and talk. And what that allows me to do is based off of what's happening in the course, I'm able to customize that video and say, for example, well, Laura, last week when we were talking and, you know, we discussed this, you wrote this in the discussion boards. And so all of a sudden people's ears perk up. I watched her head just kind of snap for a second when I said her name. We all like to hear our names, right? And so um, it allows me when I shoot those videos to, uh, to personalize that content every semester. Now, I do have some um standard uh videos that maybe might discuss a theory or something like that from our field that i that the the videos that i shoot weekly for my courses i leave them as unlisted but my standard theory you know things that i use every semester that that people might need i have those open and available on youtube and people can get them from my channel anytime that they want so you know, I'll just say it again, and I don't know how to explain it better, but for me, it all came down to the question of, was I willing to sacrifice my time up front to make it a better experience and a more affordable experience on the back end for my students? So that's my story, and that's what I do. So Spencer, I don't know if you want to ask a question or how you want to do this, but that's basically, that's what I do. That's how I do it. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I think we do want to allow everybody to answer or ask questions or, or make comments. Um, I think uh, if you were to give advice to someone who hasn't done this before, what kind of advice would you give them? Well, if you don't know how to create or find OER resources, the first thing I would do is get in touch with my librarian. Because especially at a university level, we've got folks who can help you with that. And it's not as hard as you think it is. 
finding is a lot harder sometimes than creating. Creating takes a lot of time. Finding takes a lot of patience. But I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't uh, ISU have something with Pressbooks, which is an OER publishing platform? And so, you know, it's, I, but if you don't know how to do it and you want to get started, that would be the first thing I would do is get in touch with your librarian who can help you. Yeah, that, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, ISU does have uh, a license for press books, and it's, it's a platform that allows anyone to write their own open education uh, material, and they can designate how they want to share that and to what degree. And with that license, then they can share it with their students, so their students have access to the material as well. Um, yeah, and uh, the the library does have an open and affordable educational resources committee, and so our job is to help faculty uh, and instructors who want to search for that open education uh, material, and we can help you find stuff. So. Uh, thank you, Laura. We've got uh, some links there to our OER uh, subject guide and links to the press books. Um, so um, I want to allow everybody an opportunity to ask questions. To, are there others here that, that have questions they would like to ask? You can unmute yourself now and so uh, Teresa asks a question in the chat. Um, now that the courses are set up and the OER texts created, how does your prep and grade time compare to before you used OER? How has the experience of creating your own texts changed you as an instructor? Are you a better researcher for it? Uh, those are three separate questions. So. <laughs> All right, so full disclosure, she's currently one of my students. So she's oh. <laughs> setting me up here. She's like and grilling me now. I'm just saying. <laughs> Um, my prep time is less now, um, because I reuse most of the content year by year. I have to go change dates, but Moodle's got a thing that'll kind of do that for you. Um, my videos are different, you know, year to year as I feel like the need to update them. Um, I have to, for myself, be very careful to try to go through and, check everything and make sure the links all work because um, I can't let myself get lazy with it because my prep time is different. So I would say my prep time is different, Teresa. Um, the experience of creating my own texts changed me as an instructor. Well, I actually prefer it now because I always felt guilty when we bought textbooks before and I didn't have people read the whole thing. I like it because I control the content much more. So, you know, and, and I can use the examples that I want to use. So in a fully online program, you know, we don't ever get to see each other face to face. If I'm in a face to face classroom, I can tell my story and I can use my examples, but the textbooks don't have those. And so I like it, I like creating it because I put my examples into the content of the course um, and it makes it more personal for me as an instructor. And I think it helps my students get to know me a little bit better in this online environment, in this virtual classroom. And I don't know if I'm a better researcher for it, uh, to be honest with you. Um, I think what it does is it makes me more aware of my student experience. I had a I had a, a technical writing teacher when I was a student at Ricks College years back named Rod Keller, who would give us a, a writing prompt every day. And when we would sit and write, he would sit and write. And I remember asking him once, um, uh, what are you doing? And he said, why would I ever give you something to do that I wouldn't be willing to do myself? And so he was sitting and, and writing with us. And he followed that up with, I don't ever want to forget what it's like to be a student. And that struck me. And so I think it makes me a more conscientious teacher for what I'm trying to, I'm trying to give you better content because I don't give, I don't throw as much at you as you'd get in a thick textbook, 
but I try to make sure that what I do give you is better. And so I think it's made me a better instructor. Um, my grading practices, I'm always slow grader, Teresa, and you know it. So. Uh, as a follow-up question to that, uh, it, it sounds like, or maybe this is a comment, it, it, it sounds like uh, developing the OER materials allows you to match your teaching style with the materials at hand, and you don't have to adapt your teaching style to someone else's uh, writing or structure in a textbook or something. Would you say I, that's I think, accurate? Or? I would, I would, in my case, I think that's accurate. I'm very much um, a storyteller when I teach. Um, I'm not a lecturer. And I think a lot of times a textbook is a written lecture and um, my my courses don't read like textbooks. It's a series of stories with content thrown in. And so that's much more how I teach a face-to-face -face class anyway. And so, yeah, in this, in, at least in my case, it does allow me to match the content to my style. Okay. Um. A question that occurs to me now is, uh, uh, do you ever uh, use uh, library resources um, like for reserve or do you go and find an article and put it in your Moodle course that you found on the library system or is that something you've um, ever done? I, I have done it before, <clears throat> but as I said, my field is really transitioned in the last four years to where the vast majority of things are done OER. All of the textbooks are written OER and they're all, and we're able to pull whatever chapters we want out of whatever books and plug that stuff in. And so I haven't had to do a lot of that. Um, also in our professional organization in AECT, um, which a lot of our graduate students join, um, when you join AECT, you get access to all the journals. And so we don't have to do a lot of that because our field is set up for OER. So we're really fortunate that way. Wow, that sounds really nice. What other questions do, do our participants have? Is, does anyone want, want to unmute themselves and ask a question or, or make a comment? Spencer, you know I always have questions. Oh, please do. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, John. Nice to meet you. My name is Laura. Hello. You remember Laura, the librarian. Oh, well, so easy. But um, I'm digging into OER. Uh, my interest peaked last year with our first OER um, week that we did at ISU. And I had heard about it, but there were... <clears throat> Kristen Whitman, and I'm not sure, Spencer, if you helped build the lip guide, but she was really gave us a lot of great content and training. So it's been- Kristen's awesome, by the way. Yeah, she's so good. She's so good. She, she's one of my, uh, I would like to be her. But um, so my question is, as I'm, sifting through different types of content and I have different ideas of what I might want to do. Um, you mentioned AECT. Um, first of all, what does that stand for? And second, what are your, um, what are the platforms that you like best? Like, where are you finding your best content? Is it OpenStax? Um, is it with other people in your field that you are working with? So word of mouth. All right, those are two good questions. Um, number one, um, AECT is the Association for Educational Communications and Technology. Ah. And uh, I'm getting, and uh, so we are the field for educate, we are the, the, the academic organization for educational technology. So instructional design needs assessment, educational evaluation that were those guys um and uh uh and as far as where we get our stuff i'm going to put a link up here for you 
uh, Laura, to add to your to your ex exploration, edtechbooks.org. And uh, as I said, everything in my in our field right now is is now going to there. And uh, so I'm at the front page right now. There's and the books that are shown, the highest rated books they have on here are Advanced Writing, Writing in the Social Sciences, Distance Education and Blended Learning Handbook, Educational Research Across Multiple Paradigms, Digital Tools and Apps, the K-12 Educational Technology Handbook, Designing Surveys and Designing for Learning. Mm -hmm. and, they, and then they also have, we have one of our major um, journals in the field also uh, just moved to being published on edtechbooks.org as well. So it went fully OER and which is awesome. And uh, um, so in, in, in the field, um, this is where everything is going. I don't have to do a whole lot of search because everybody is making everything open right now in my field, which is really, really fortunate. Um, now, you know as well as I do that not every field lends itself to OER, right? I don't know how I'm going to, how I would teach dance OER, right? I mean, you can create videos and share those, but, you, but I, I use that as an example because it's an extreme one, right? But I can tell you this, I know OpenStax, I know CK12, right? CK12 in the P12 environment is huge. One of my former doctoral students who is an OER researcher, her name is Heather Morin. She's a uh, library media specialist in Georgia. And she sits on, and she did her, her doctoral capstone on OER resources. And she's, I don't know if she still does, but at least she sat on CK-12's think tank uh, for, for P-12. She does a lot with uh, help teaching the teachers in her school district to create o OER materials and they create their own textbooks for the district and they use CK-12. So I don't know if I answered your question. I know I got that the AECT part right, but I don't know if I answered the other part right. You did. Uh, my last follow-up question, well, I guess my, I have one follow-up question about that. What was the name of the journal, the OER journal? Oh man. <laughs> Us libraries, but we're annoying. <laughs> no, I got it. I got it. Oh, I know how I can look it up. Give me two seconds. Because it's Jill Stefaniak, the editor. I just can't remember. I get a, a couple of them mixed up. Uh, I can't see it right off the top of my head or on this on this thing. Okay. That looks right. Yeah, Jade. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. Journal of Applied Instructional Design. Is that the one that Jill edits? Teresa? That's it. Yep, then that's it. Journal of Applied Instructional Design. Well, great. Hey, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Curry, for uh, presenting and talking to us uh, about your OER experiences. It's uh, pretty exciting for, for me to participate in these uh, presentations, just to hear um, what inspired people to get involved and, and how, how the movement seems to be going in a, a positive direction with more uh, momentum. There are more people involved, more materials. And it seems to me like even in other disciplines, uh, others are catching the, the vision and, and starting to do this more and more. So I, I should say that I did teach a class last year too. I forgot, I forgot about this right now. I taught a class specifically just on OER last year. And I got all the materials from David Wiley, who's had licensed them all OER. So I have a ton of research that came straight from David. So if you want anything, or even if you want to get hooked up with David, I know I could hook you up with him. So... That would be fantastic. Yeah, that, that sounds wonderful. Well, if there are no other questions or comments, I think we'll uh, we'll finish the, the
the, the meeting today. And uh, thank you so much for talking with us today, Dr. Curry, and thank you for your time. And thank you everyone else for attending. Uh, we have one other presentation that is tomorrow at 10 o'clock. And I think uh, that person is Mary Von Van Donsel, I think, is it, if I get her name right. Von Donsel? Uh, is, uh, is it Van Donsel? Oh, let me look at, there's an A or an N, hold on. <laughs> At, it's tomorrow at 10. And he, so Mary Van Donsel, I think. Yeah, yeah Mary Van Donsel. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. So uh, uh, be sure to attend that if that fits in your schedule. And uh, I think that would be a good presentation as well. So um, thanks again. And we'll have a, a we'll, we'll say goodbye and, and wish everybody to have a good day. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. See you, everybody. Bye.